A work breakdown structure, or WBS, is a critical tool and document in project management. In this short video, you will learn what a WBS is and how to develop one. First of all, a WBS is a key part of managing project scope, shown on screen in the red box. Project scope involves defining what needs to be done for the project to be considered successfully completed. To understand what needs to be done, the project manager needs to be clear on the purpose of the project, its goals and benefits, as well as key project constraints, assumptions, inclusions and also exclusions, as in what is not part of this project that others might actually think is included. The inclusions in a project scope is usually expressed as a group of deliverables. For example, in a home renovation, the project scope may be to update the kitchen, the main bathroom and ensuite, and paint the exterior of the house. These are the key deliverables of the project. The work breakdown structure will need to clearly include these deliverables to make sure the total scope of the project is met. It's also a key input to other parts of the project, such as managing the project time and schedule. This makes sense. You need to have a clear idea of what you need to do before you figure out when to do it, how much it will cost, and so forth. So the way to describe a work breakdown structure is that it is a key scoping tool. It's a deliverable orientated grouping of the work involved in a project and defines the total scope of the project. As you may now appreciate, it's a foundation document. It provides a basis for all planning activities, as well as managing the project schedule, costs and changes. It's also a key tool for communicating the project to all stakeholders. Another way to think of the WBS is as a high level or master to-do list. If you miss something off the list, it won't get done. For example, if the renovation project didn't include updating the kitchen on the WBS, it wouldn't get done and the homeowner would be really upset. The benefits of creating a good WBS should now be obvious. To build a WBS, there are a few principles to follow and we'll briefly go through them now. So firstly, a unit of work should appear at only one place in the work breakdown structure. Now, why do you think that would be important? Hmm. Well, hopefully you thought about the fact that if a piece of work is in two places, there's a good chance it could get done twice. So we do want to avoid that repetition or rework or those mistakes by making sure that a unit of work does only appear in one place. The work content of a WBS item is the sum of the WBS items below it. So it has a cascading or a hierarchical structure. A WBS item is a responsibility of only one individual, even though many people may be working on it. The WBS must be consistent with the way in which work is actually going to be performed, so it should serve the project team first and other purposes only if practical. Number five, project team members should be involved in developing the WBS to ensure consistency and also buy-in. And finally, number six, the WBS must be a flexible tool to accommodate inevitable changes while properly maintaining control of the work content in the project according to the scope statement. This is a highly visual format for a WBS. It looks a bit like an organisational chart and works the same way. It's a hierarchical structure. So at the very top you have the name of the project, the key deliverables are then on this second level and underneath each deliverable are the different work packages or sub deliverables that need to get done. So for example, if I complete work package one, work package two and work package three, that will mean that deliverable one is complete. These lower level work packages equal the deliverable that's on top. If we get all of these deliverables done, then we've completed the entire project. There are broadly two types of WBS styles and we'll look at them both now. The first is a product style. 
Using our renovation example, the different deliverables or products appear across the top line. So here we have the renovation project. The first deliverable is to update the kitchen, then update the bathroom, update the ensuite, and paint the house exterior. So underneath each of these deliverables is the key work. So under updating the kitchen, we first design the kitchen, we then renovate the kitchen, and then we do all the finishing off activities. So once all of these things are complete, that will equal that we've updated the kitchen. The more fine grain tasks and activities are not shown on the WBS as it becomes too messy and hard to understand. However, the individual activities will appear in the project schedule, which breaks the WBS down even further. For example, under kitchen design, there will be subtasks and activities such as consultation, deciding and signing off on the design and inclusions. Under the kitchen renovation, we'll have to demolish and remove the old kitchen. So that will be a key task. And then we'll have to install the new kitchen. In here also, the appliances will need to be procured, delivered and inspected before being installed. And lastly, you know, all the different fittings and finishings will need to be done once the kitchen, the new kitchen is in. What you may notice here, though, is time is not inferred in this WBS style. For example, several of the deliverables could be occurring or being completed concurrently. So the kitchen could be getting done by one work team while the bathroom is getting done by another team. A completely different contractor may be doing the house painting, also scheduled to occur at the same time as the kitchen and bathroom renovation. The second style is a process style. So this is the exact same scope of work, only it's expressed in a different way. The phases or stages in the project are now across the top, design, renovation and finishing. Under design, we can see the different deliverables, kitchen, bathroom, ensuite and the painting. In this style of WBS, time is inferred with the highest level deliverables. For example, you can't complete the renovation work until the design has been completed and you can't do all the fitting and finishing tasks until the bulk of the renovation is completed. So it follows a sequence. First we design, then we renovate and then we finish. Some project managers will also use phases across the top level, such as phase one, phase two, phase three, when using a process style WBS, and this is perfectly fine. The most important point is that it still sums up the high level work of the project, ready to be broken down further in the project schedule, or even a WBS dictionary if that's used on your project. So which one should you use? the product style or the process style? Well, the first point is that you don't use both on one project. You need to select one and use only the one you've selected for the duration of that specific project. However, in order to decide which one is best for your current project, you might try drafting your WBS both ways. This should help you figure out which way works best and easiest for your stakeholders to understand and for you to use as a project team. In some industries, one way may also be preferred over the other. For example, in construction, the process style is generally more popular. Now you can also use the internet search to get some more ideas. So it's a good idea to have a look around, draft according to the two different styles, and then make your decision with the one that you like best. So here is a WBS for a new software project. On the left hand side, it's shown in a graphical format. And on the right hand side, it's shown as a list format. It's the same scope of work. It's the same project, just expressed two different ways. Now, looking at this project, firstly, can you tell which style of WBS has been used? Is this a product style or a process style? Yes, it's a process style. We can tell because time is inferred across the top. 
First we design, then we do the programming, and then we do the testing. Now on this work breakdown structure, it also shows coding. And a work breakdown structure does need to have a code. This avoids confusion. So when you produce a work breakdown structure, ensure you code it and follow the hierarchy. So we can uh, see here, this the whole project is number one. It might be the only project. Sometimes your project might be one of several and yours might be called project three, for example. In this instance, this is project number one. So the key deliverables, in this instance, it's done as a process, uh, is 1.1 design, 1.2 programming, 1.3 testing. So then under the design phase, we have 1.1.1, first design phase, and 1.1.2, second design phase. Underneath each phase, there are also a couple of subtasks here. So 1.1.1.1, we design task 1, 1.1.1.2, design task 2. So hopefully this structure is fairly clear. Uh, it will just save a lot of confusion and concerns once your project starts, and especially on a large project with a lot of different deliverables and activities and tasks. All these things can get very confusing. The last thing I guess to notice on this one is each of the little boxes have fairly short names. This is important. You don't want a big long name. And each individual box is named differently to all of the others. So it's very important that each box is named and numbered uniquely, again, to avoid confusion or doubling up work, you know, creating issues for your project and, and you're, you know, going over your project scope. So you may wonder where to get information for creating a work breakdown structure. So the first place is your key stakeholders, such as the project sponsor, the project team, if you have them in place already, and the client. And you can consult with the different stakeholders one-on-one -on -one or hold a stakeholder workshop to extract scoping information that will help you build the work breakdown structure and other tools such as the scope management plan or the project plan. When you're first handed a project, you should also try to find out information from people who have run similar projects. So this could be from company records or talking to other project managers. Sometimes a project manager will be given a signed off document, such as a contract for services or proposal document. Within these documents, you can find information on deliverables to, to help you build that WBS. So often this could be in the project description, a scope of work section, or even in an appendix or an attachment that details what has been agreed to by both parties. You're looking for indications of deliverables because that's really what the work breakdown structure is trying to articulate. And on a last note here, it's always a good idea to try drafting a work breakdown structure early and then take it to stakeholders to evaluate or critique and develop further, add more things. This is often easier than presenting your stakeholders with just a blank page. So yeah, have a little bit of a draft first. Uh, this is our last slide now. So if your project team is in place, you may run a, a stakeholder workshop. You can use post-it notes and mind maps and whiteboards to help figure out the WBS as a group. It's good to use these techniques because they're flexible and easy to change, really useful for brainstorming activities. You can easily rub things out and move things around. Uh, there are also digital versions of these same things. You can have digital post-it notes and digital whiteboards. So the next step is to draft a rough WBS for your project. Try it in both the product and the process style and discuss it with others and finalize your preferred method. Be prepared that the WBS will remain draft until the end of the project planning phase of the project life cycle, as sometimes the scope can change during planning. You know, the client may change their mind or you might figure out that you need to do additional work to actually complete the project. You can very easily add or subtract the boxes from a graphical work breakdown structure to respond to any changes during the planning phase. 
At the end of the project planning phase, you should have a project management plan with a finalized work breakdown structure. So once the project plan with the WBS is approved or signed off, we'll call this the baseline WBS. And in project management after planning, we like to baseline everything, baseline the schedule, the budget, and so forth. So sort of draws a line under the plan to say this is what we're what we're seeking to achieve. When the project moves to implementation or execution phase, there may be further changes to the WBS, but we treat those as variations and we use a scope change control process. This prevents uncontrolled change from occurring, which is also known as scope creep. We track scope changes against our initial baseline, which can then give us insights and lessons learned as the project progresses and finalizes. So that's the end of this short video. I hope that's been interesting for you and good luck in building your work breakdown structure.